Good. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, Ian Poole, uh, who's a distinguished theological writer and well-known figure in the contemporary Church of England. Um, he, Ian has been and for many years and continues to be much involved in parish ministry, and he's also served on the staff of St. John's College, Nottingham. Um, having sensed a call to a more freelance role as a theologian and biblical scholar, he's a prolific writer and blogger, and uh, especially over many years has been very much involved in the publication of the Grove Books series. And as many of you will know, he's a member also of the General Synod. Uh, I, think, I think it's interesting that, like Karen Kilby, who spoke to us yesterday, Ian has a background in mathematics. Uh, indeed, his, his blog is called by this slightly unpronounceable name. Se is it Sefiz? Sefitso, yeah, sorry. This shows how long ago I did my New Testament Greek. Um, meaning and kind of picking up that mathematical background, uh, meaning to calculate or to reckon out, um, which I think, yes, I think kind of seems to me to gesture both towards mathematics uh, and also to uh, his emphasis uh, consistently in his work on the cost of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ and to be, uh, in the terms of our conference, called and sent out by him. Um, he also has, uh, I think, another point of commonality with yesterday's speaker is his commitment to expressing often quite complex theological ideas in clear and accessible ways so that they can be made available to a wide audience. So um, welcome, Ian. He speaks to us today on vocation in the economy of God. Uh, thank you very much for, for your welcome. Uh, and uh, it's having trekked from the East Midlands down to the South Coast to, in fact, the far corner. I must admit, whenever it invited me, I did get slightly confused because it was Chichester Diocese in Canterbury, which I was thinking, now, which diocese am I, am I speaking to? But it, I've been really delighted to realise how many folk um, uh, I know here. Uh, and, in fact, I've met people who I was at youth group with when I was 14 years old. Uh, where is Paul Owen? There we go, Paul. Now, actually, I need to just pay a little bit of tribute to Paul. Hope to run the back. We've got a spotlight we can shine on because um, in September 1976, I found myself meeting a group of folk at a local youth group, an Anglican church. And I think it was Paul driving a Morris 1100. Do you remember that? Was that you, a little car? Yes, and, uh, and I went back and we spent the, they said, would you like to come back to the coffee bar? And I thought, bar? Oh, gosh, what? I don't... And anyway, went back to the coffee bar, and Paul entertained me by tearing up Coke cans and making sculptures out of them. I don't know if you still do that. Um, but I, I'll, <laughs> I'll come back to that later, because actually that was part of my journey to living faith. So, uh, Paul, I'm very grateful for the welcome that I received there. Um, and also, folk I was at school with her here and at university, and then at uh, Theological College, both when I was training and then when I went back on, on the staff. So it does feel as though uh, I'm amongst friends. So thank you for your welcome. Um, you may be wondering about my shirt. A number of people already commented. Um, uh, I, I'm wearing, wearing this uh, because uh, Bishop Richard actually requested it specifically. Um, this is... <laughs> I had checked with Adam what the sort of uh, the, the dress code was, and he said, well, really, you know, anything like really from... Uh, shorts and t-shirt to cassock, so I, I decided not to wear my cassock because I'm a bit warm. Um, still recovering from that early morning run with James de Castiglione. Um, uh, I, why, the, why Richard, you weren't there, I don't know, but anyway. Um, uh, but this is my birthday shirt, it was my birthday last Friday, and it was um, given to me by my daughter, my youngest, who I took to Gatwick Airport, and she is now in Costa Rica, beginning her gap year, so we're in that moment of transition. And I promised her, I hope you won't mind, if I actually take a selfie of myself in the shirt <laughs> in front of you, not least to maintain my reputation as a cutting-edge social media personality. So if I... <laughs> Hang on. Okay, if you can all wave, particularly in the middle section there. 
That's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm flattered, too, that Edward um, uh, commented that I'm a well-known figure. Um, at least two people I greeted this morning who I recognize said, I've no idea who you are. Um, <laughs> so I had to remind them when we'd met. One of them was, was Fiona Windsor, actually. And, uh, <laughs> She also helpfully said, I said, how's the conference going? She said, oh, well, Karen Kilby yesterday, she was just brilliant. <laughs> so I said, thanks, Fiona, no, no pressure there at all. Apparently, she handled the questions just superbly as well, so uh, that's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have an artifact here. It's, you may not have seen one of these recently. Uh, for those of you under the age of 40, this is called a letter. Uh, we used to, in the old days, use these to communicate with one another. And what people used to do is they used to sit at their desks and they used to have, in my case, it was a green Olivetti, a thing called a typewriter. And uh, what it used to do is you press a key and it had a thing which made an impression on the piece of paper. And so I've got this letter and this was uh, dated 26th of March, 1987. And it's from the Diocesan Director of Ordinans in Rochester Diocese. Thank you for your good letter of 8th of March. I've got no idea what I wrote because I think I used a pen and I didn't keep a copy. Uh, and thank you for your phone call. And uh, I'd be very happy to proceed with your exploration of your vocation. When we last met in November 85, we left it that in 1987 would possibly be the year for thinking about an ACOM selection conference. <laughs> Way. Remember that? Uh, we're on a th our third, no, second or third uh, reincarnation. Obviously, you're still thinking this way. If, you're st if you are still thinking this way, I've had a word with Reverend Alan Eves, who supports this thought. So there we go. So what was, I found very interesting in thinking about vocation and calling was clearly for my DDO in 1987, vocation was something that people had if they were thinking about being ordained. And I just want to begin by reflecting, if you've got a handout, it'll give you an idea of the shape of, I feel as though I ought to be like Neville Chamberlain, you know, so waving a, a white piece of paper. It should be in a museum or something. The reason I came across that is because actually I've, um, I don't know if you've ever worked out how many times you've moved house. Uh, I, last year, for some reason, I decided to calculate. I've actually moved 13 times. I don't know if that sounds a lot or not. That, that's an average, I worked an average of 4.3 years in each place. Um, so obviously some, some of those are much shorter than others. But actually that, those moves, many of them have come out of my sense of vocation, what I felt God has called me to do. But I mentioned that letter in relation to a couple of other observations, experiences I've had of people talking about their vocation. And these are just some things that people said to me uh, in the last uh, few weeks or so. Um, this was um, quite interesting. I had a... Um, somebody who I mostly know online that I've met a couple of times in person and we had a bit of an exchange and a discussion about something and he said, I feel as though we're not getting on at the moment, why is that? And we had a discussion uh, exchanging electronic messages, not letters. Um, but he, he, it was actually a very generous comment he made and at the end of it he, he said this, he said, um, I, when he said it, he talked about praying for me, he said, I pray for you, whatever you would pray for me, that God will bless you and flourish you and your family and so on. Uh, and then he said this, which I thought was quite striking, and I pray that each of us discovers how we are a unique part of God's creation and that we come to discover the unique vocation that emerges from that fact. So there's just one way of talking about vocation. Uh, here's another one from quite a different context. Um, I was watching a film, uh, one of the things my daughter and I, before she left, was, would like to do is we, we've got some favourite films we like to watch, and I was just reading up about one of the actresses in uh, a particular film, and uh, I've discovered something about the story of how she came to be in film. And the story, part of the story went like this. She wrote a letter to Kenneth Branagh asking him for advice. I explained that my parents didn't want me to act but that I felt it was my vocation in life, she said. Branagh's sister replied, Kenneth says that if you feel such a strong need to be an actress, you must be an actress. That's around the question of her vocation. And here's a third example of the way people talk about vocation. This is um, 
Uh, a friend of mine, again, uh, quite often we, he lives in the States, he teaches in uh, Oklahoma Baptist University. Uh, he's a Revelation scholar, so he's a great guy. I shared a room with him at a conference once, I discovered he snores extremely loudly, but never mind, I won't tell you who it is, so I'm not giving anything away. And um, he was just talking about, uh, it was in August, because in, in the States, obviously, terms, terms, university terms start earlier, they start in August. I know classes started last week, but it coincided with a touch of bronchitis for me. Today was the first day I actually had my voice back, mostly, and felt much better. At the end of a long day of teaching and meeting with students, I'm reminded of how much I love teaching. It's not a job, it's a calling and passion. What make, it, it is actually a job, he does get paid actually. Uh, what makes it even better is the fact that OBU, Oklahoma Baptist University, has the best students, in, that his students are reading this I should think. Engaging their minds and watching them pro process what they're learning gives me such joy and satisfaction. It's a privilege and an honor, without a U, to teach university students, I love what I do. Now in just thinking about today, it seemed to me those, my letter that I just discovered uh, in clearing out boxes of stuff that I've carried from 13 moves from one house to another, uh, and just those observations, made me realize something about the way that vocation, the language of vocation, is used uh, in contemporary culture, in discourse, wider discourse outside the church, but actually creepingly often in the church as well. And you might think some of these are good, you might think some of these are bad, some of them might be neutral, and I'm not trying to offer any particular judgment about them, I think simply observing this is the way that the language is used. And the first thing is what I call individuation. Individuation. In other words, as we um, uh, saw in that person praying for me, I, d I hope that, pray that God, you'll discover the unique vocation that you have. Very often, people talk about their vocation in order to identify what is special about them or what is the particular thing that they're going to do. It's very rare for people to talk about vocation as a way of discovering their belonging to a particular community. It's usually saying, what's your vocation? What's your individual? What's the thing that makes you special? So it functions to individuate people one from another. That's not quite the same as individualism, but it has quite a strong individual personal focus. Here's the second thing I think that uh, vocation, uh, the language of vocation often does, uh, or often springs from, a sense of what I'd call interiorization. So the sense of vocation springs from something deep and something internal to me. Uh, somebody said to me, that when I, said, uh, uh, I asked the question, what is vocation? Somebody said, a thing that one feels compelled to do. And that can be a good thing because, you know, we often have deep longings, deep desires, uh, a, a deep sense of commitment to something particular or, or, or some particular direction in life. But it can also be frustrating. And I think I'm very conscious, I was very conscious in 1987, that this sense of interior feeling, I think used to be the primary paradigm by which vocation to ordain ministry was discerned. And I felt a bit nervous about that, I've got to, I've got to admit, for two reasons. Number one, I was going to say I am an extrovert, I'm not sure I am anymore, but anyway, certainly then I was, number one. Number two, I am an evangelical, and I think in, in both those things, that personal thing and that theological tradition, there tends to be much more focus on the exterior rather than the interior. And I was a bit nervous of going to a, a, through the process and the selection panel and somebody saying, well, how long have you felt you wanted to be a priest? To which the answer would have been, well, I just sort of really thought about it in the last couple of years, really. And that was, I was aware that was a very striking contrast to other people I've met who said, oh, well, you know, I've I felt this sense of vocation since I was five or, uh, or, or whatever. I think the paradigm in the Church of England is probably changing now. Uh, and it's interesting that a DDO said to me, as a DDO, I sometimes got weary of people saying they felt called to be a priest. And then they'd get rattled if I asked what they were doing to bear witness to that call. In other words, the DDO was, was meeting people who had this deeply interiorized sense of vocation, and when he challenged them to say, well, what's the external expression of that, then they were struggling uh, to find an answer. Third thing uh, I think uh, often happens is vocation is used uh, for stratification. What I mean by that is that the sense of vocation often functions to create a distinct vocational caste. 
So we tend to use the language of vocation about, for example, the caring professions. My wife is a doctor. She has a vocation to be a doctor or to be a nurse. Actually, she thought about being a nurse, and I don't know if there are many nurses here, but she thought it was all jolly messy and difficult, so she thought she'd rather be a doctor. But, um, so, but certainly she has a sense of vocation uh, to, to what she does. But it's quite unusual for us to think about people having a vocation to be a, uh, a dustman or a vocation to be uh, someone sweeping the streets or a vocation to be someone working in a factory on a factory line or a vocation to, do, to be a shop assistant. In fact, I was really struck by the fact that somebody said to me, uh, talked about someone in their congregation. We had this, a testimony from a guy in church. He was a train driver. He was called by God to do it. And he saw driving trains as his vocation. It was powerful testimony about God's leading in an individual's life. And I think that's really interesting because it's so unusual. And I think one of the things that in the Church of England, I think we're seriously wrestling with is the way that our understanding of vocation in relation to ministry functions often in people's minds uh, towards the creation of a priestly caste. And some people feel quite concerned about uh, the clericalization of the church. If you open the church times and you find out what is going on in the church, uh, usually that revolves around clerical type people, usually around bishops. So I just sometimes go through the church times and turn the pages over and count how many people dressed in purple cassocks I can see. But for the church times, it seems as though what the church is doing is what the people in uh, purple are doing. And in fact, a couple of years ago in, church, in the church times, somebody wrote an article saying, if the church lost all its congregations and nobody actually came on a Sunday, the church would still do its most important tasks. Sorry, that was the cue for a sharp intake of breath, okay? So I try that again. If there were no congregations, no people in the pews, the church would still do its most important tasks. That is a really extraordinary vision of what the church is and what church, uh, what vocation is about. Fourthly, um, I think that very often vocation is used in the sense of self-actualization. Now, my friend in America who I quoted, he's a lovely guy, he's a lovely Christian minister, and, um, I, it, but I thought it was really interesting that he aligned vocation with what he really loved and found deeply rewarding day by day. Now, I'm not suggesting that we need to go out and beat ourselves with birch rods every day, and, you know, if you're not miserable, you're not doing what God wants, but... We need to recognise that vocation is so often used in that sense. I had a deep need to be an actress and that's what, you know, and now I'm fulfilled. So vocation is the way I self-actualise. Vocation is the way I use those gifts and things that I was always meant to use. Uh, someone else said to me, I'm currently on sabbatical and writing a book on vocation. So I can't give you a short answer to what it is, but I, say, I, I will say, in the church we're too narrow and can make ministers, monks and missionaries the only one with a vocation. Outside the church, people dis disconnect vocation from the caller, and it's all about self-fulfillment. Uh, fifthly, I think one of the things that happens with vocation is actually it gets marginalised. And, and you, you might be saying, oh, actually, and these aren't five different things, they're all related to one another. And, and, and I think they are. The fact that vocation applies only to certain things and not to others. I, I must admit, I've never heard anyone come up to me and say, do you know, I really feel God is calling me to be a banker or an international trader on the commodities markets. I've never heard anyone say, oh, I, I feel like God's called me to be wealthy. Actually, I do know some people, but they're mostly on the other side of the pond. But vocation only applies to certain worthy things. Most of life, actually, there are much more important things to do. Fascinating series, by the way, um, on Radio 4 at the moment with uh, Jonathan Sachs. Look at a whole series this week on um, ethics and morality. What is morality? I listened to a little bit last night. Um, and uh, just the fact that, interesting, he was interviewing some young people saying, he interviewed Jordan Peterson and interviewed some young people and saying, what do you think about what he said and how do you understand morality? And actually, even those people, those millennials in their 20s were saying, you know, it feels as though society has been crushed under the weight of what you might call neoliberalist economics, that the only things that matter are the things that make money. And in that context, um, vocation is being marginalised. Um, I came across this diagram. I'd never heard this word before. Have you heard this? Ik ikigai. Ikigai, a Japanese concept meaning a reason for being. And apparently you have a reason for being if you're doing what you love, what the world needs, what you can be paid for, and what you're good at. I'm thinking I'd really like to meet someone who's in the middle there, because I, 
I can't think of anyone off the top of my head. And I'm really struck by the fact that vocation is put in the, in the overlap between what the world needs and what you can be paid for. I thought, well, that's news to certainly most clergy in the Church of England. <laughs> um, the little triangle at the top there is delight and fullness, but no wealth. I want to say kind of welcome to my world. <laughs> but I think that's fascinating because actually vocation then becomes marginalised. If, if you're not good at something, if it's not what you love, and it, you can't be paid for it, then actually it's, it's not really what counts. So if that's a kind of phenomenon, that's the way that vocation is perceived, what then does vocation look like in the economy of God? And kind of Edward said, well, to me, when briefing me about talking about this uh, um, uh, by email exchange, he said, well, kind of, we want a sort of an, uh, engage in the scriptures and a sort of an overview of, of the economy of God and how vocation functions in that. I hope that's what you said, because that's what I'm going to do. Um, so we're going to have, have a quick whiz through the whole Bible, if that's Okay. Um, and you might, if you've got a physical Bible, you might uh, open that. I was actually going to go up to somebody I know and steal a physical Bible so I could symbolise, you know, having, having the scriptures in front of me. But you'd have to imagine that. Unless I see someone now, I'm going to pounce on. You look pounceable, James. Can I, can I steal your codex? You're taking out all your personal notes now. Thank you very much. I feel I have to do this because yesterday morning's blog was on how we shouldn't read tech, biblical text digitally. We should only ever read from a printed Bible. So now I am practicing what I preach. Is that all right? So you might want to turn to me. We're going to start um, uh, going through from Genesis. It's a good place to start. And just a couple of reflections on each of these. And I've picked out ten. These aren't comprehensive and they're not systematic. But they seem to me to be some key points within the economy of God, the narrative of God's dealing with creation in the scriptures, where vocation or calling seem to be particularly the focus of what was happening. So Genesis chapter 1, and you'll be aware of the two creation accounts in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2. And just a couple of um, observations of that. I do think, you, you'll know this, this is the creation of Adam by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel, and it's a great picture to have because it's well known. I, I, I can't think of any part of that picture which bears any relation whatsoever to the biblical account. So I've got no idea what Michelangelo was thinking of. If you're an art historian and you can help me with that, then do. Uh, reaching out and touching with a finger? I, no, I don't know. I have no idea what that's about. Anyway, just a couple of observations about the creation account. The first is you might say, well, Ian, this isn't really about vocation, except that what's really interesting, particularly in, in chapter 1, is the prominence of God's voice. So God says, let there be light, and there was light. What God said became reality. God's voice, God's call, was the creative power that brought something out of nothing. And I think there's so many resonances with that, so many things that we can, we can reflect on that. I think it's really fascinating, the whole question about um, how do you make sense of God in, from, from a, in a scientific world? You know, is there a reason for God? Um, and uh, I don't know if any of you read Paul Davis's book. Paul Davis is an Australian scientist, um, and he, he wrote a book called Goldilocks Principle. And he's not, a, he's not a Christian, but he points out that science is all about explaining why things are. And yet the biggest question is why there is something rather than nothing, and that's the one question science can never answer. So actually the idea of God creating from nothing is really significant in terms of our own apologetic engagement with a scientific context. Um, Ed, was it possible to have a... Oh, yes, a glass of water. A bottle of water. Thank you. So God created out of nothing. In other words, the created world did not ask to be made. The world around us did not self-generate in theological terms, but it was called forth by God. In other words, existence is the result of God's calling, of God's vocation. I did not ask to be born. In fact, also, as, as we know, some of the prophets said, why was I born? Life, this vocation isn't straightforward. I didn't ask to be born, and I didn't ask to be made the person that I am made. I have been made, as it were, ex nihilo. Well, it's not quite ex nihilo. I know God had some material to use in you know, my mother and father's gen genetic material, but I did not choose that. 
God's calling of me into existence, God's calling of the world into existence, is a reflection of his sovereign power and his decision. And apart from the apologetic importance of that, it's got really serious pastoral importance as well. I remember quite a few years ago when I was in, in parish ministry in Poole in Dorset, and a particular um, person in the congregation who was a, a significant person, but really struggling with some of the issues around who she was, her personality, how that was worked out in family life. And I felt I needed to say to her, who you are is God's gift to you. Who you are in terms of, not in terms of the, the, the failings and the faults and the things we struggle with, but just in terms of the shape of the personality. Who you are is God's gift to you. I am, I am not like Karen Kilby. I am not like James D. Castiglione. I'm not like other people. I, and I have to tell you, I'm sometimes frustrated with who I am and I have to remember that I am who I am because that is who God has called me to be, called me into existence. And I think that's really significant and that's something we, we, we learn from the creation account. But we learn more than that. God called creation to existence. God called us into being. And, and also in, in two ways in the two different accounts. So in Genesis 1, he says, let us make humanity in our image, male and female. And in chapter 2, even more strikingly, he he draws the Adam, the earth creature, out of the Adama, out of the dust. And in fact, that's representative. You know Chartres Cathedral on the, I think it's the um, north porch, there's, a, there's actually a sculpture of the creation of Adam. And Adam is actually half emerged from the dust. And as he's half emerged, he's actually resting on the lap of God. And it's a wonderful picture of God's sovereignty and vocation in calling us into existence but of course he goes on and actually gives humanity a vocation and there's a vocation to to share in God's sovereignty let us make them let, us, they, let, let them rule over the fish of the air the birds of the the birds of the air so fish of the air birds of the, birds of the air <laughs> fish of the sea and the creeping creatures that creep on the ground I love the creepy creatures particularly um, and, and to share God's sovereignty and to be fruitful and multiply. And then we see in the, the, the second creation account the way that God has shaped in his sovereignty humanity, male and female, in order to come together to exhibit that fruitfulness to which God has called us as our vocation. So that's the first observation, that creation is God's vocation calling the world uh, into being. And then as we keep going, we reach an, another crucial point uh, of uh, vocation. And that's the call of Abraham. So that's just turning on to Genesis chapter 12. And there's just a number of fascinating things to notice here. Um, we usually read uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And there's a sense in which we see the the calling of God as introducing disruption and introducing discontinuity. Um, I've been, we've been travelling around a little bit this year. Uh, we've travelled to North Africa, to Morocco, um, been to Poland. Um, I had the privilege to go to Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia and to do some teaching with local church leaders there. Quite a, quite a tough context to be in. Uh, not hospitable to Christian faith at all. In fact, um, after I'd, I'd covered the, the vicar at the International Church, the minister at the International Church, and I, I heard a couple of weeks later, he got a phone call from the local authority to ask who this person was who'd come. So somebody in the congregation had reported me to the uh, local government. Um, so that's not an easy situation. Um, but in those contexts, family or tribal loyalty is everything. So your fundamental commitment is to your clan, to your people. And if someone from another clan offends your clan, then you know you, you defend them, you stand up for them. And here, in this similar kind of cultural context, the, the call of God comes to Abraham, go from your country and from your kindred and from your father's house. We see a disruption of those natural uh, kindred loyalties, which of course we see revisited again in Jesus' call to his disciples. Uh, I, um, when Jesus calls the, the, the fishermen, you know, the most striking thing is that he says they left their father with the net. So Jesus' call similarly disrupts those kindred loyalties. But what's really fascinating, if you just read a couple of verses earlier, Terah took his son Abraham and his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his wife, son's Abraham's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldees to go to the land of Canaan, but when they came to Haran, they settled there. Isn't that interesting? So actually God's 
vocation, God's call to Abraham, doesn't just disrupt his family. Actually, what it does, it completes that which was incomplete. We don't know why, but for Abraham's father, Abraham's father was actually to make that journey, but he failed. He stopped halfway. So God's vocation to him renewed something that should have happened, and it completed that trajectory which was incomplete. Um, two other striking things about Abraham's call. One is that uh, he doesn't tell Abraham where he's going. Get up and leave and go to the country that I will show you. So the call is open-ended. Abraham has to respond, not knowing where the journey will end. But even more than that, we see in later chapters, God's promise to Abraham is that I will make your descendants as many as the stars of the sky and the sea of the seashore. Did Abraham see that realized? Of course not. He couldn't possibly. God's call draws us into an open future. One of my favorite films is the film Arrival. Has anyone seen Arrival? Oh, one or two? Oh, you really, really must go and see it. I'm going to try and say something about it, which isn't going to be a complete plot spoiler. But, <laughs> but hmm, how can I say this? One of the central issues in the film is... If you knew everything that was going to happen in your life in the future, would you still live it? If you knew that a decision was going to lead to tragedy, will you still make that decision, knowing where it would lead? Now, that's a challenging question. Here's an even more challenging question. Will you live your life not knowing what the future is? Will you follow God's call to a new place of ministry or to a new role or to a new exploration, not knowing where it will end up. And it seems to me it's one of the fundamental things about our finitude, one of the fundamental realities of creatureliness is that we do not know our future. It's sometimes been said that we tend to think of the future as in front of us and the past behind, whereas actually uh, in, in the scriptures people tend to think the other way around. They tend to think of the past as the path that they can see because you can't see the future. You're constantly walking backwards because you can't see where you're going. And you're guided only by the voice of God into the future that you don't know. And that seems to me a fundamental part of the reality of God's vocation, God's call of us. Thirdly, the second part of election is uh, God's call on uh, his people Israel. And the reason I've just put that map up, because that seems to me to be a visual illustration of uh, Deuteronomy 7 verse 7 where God says to people, do not think, O Jacob, that I've called you because you were the greatest among the people. Don't think I've called you because you were more numerous. You weren't. You were less numerous. You were small. You were insignificant. And again, there's a different expression, articulation of the sovereignty of God's call. God does not call the great and the mighty and the important. And the reason you look at that map and say, okay, this is the plan. Here's the world. God has an idea. He wants the world transformed. God's going to choose some people to help him with that task. Which one of those countries would you choose? <laughs> and the answer is, probably not that little one in the middle. Not least because it's about the only country in the region that doesn't have oil wealth. And I think all the Jews sit there going, thanks very much for that. That was a great choice, wasn't it? And of course, you'll recognize that people on the left in that quite large country there think that actually that's their role to change the world and to civilize it, because of course they're big and wealthy and mighty and have the largest army in the world. So of course they're naturally chosen for that role. But Deuteronomy 7 verse 7 says, it's actually I've called you because you're small. So God's calling is actually about using that which is insignificant, because if God used that which was significant, everyone would say, well, it's not about God, it's about the significance of those people. And then Hosea 11 is another key moment, I think, where uh, God talks about... Um, uh, his call, Hosea 11. Out of Egypt I called my son. And although the people are insignificant, although God is sovereign, this is really fascinating. God lives with the people's refusal. He's frustrated by it. But it happens. This is not God acting as a totalitarian despot who forces the people. He is calling, he is inviting, but they would not. I could not let you go, my heart would not let me do it. Compassion rises up within me. God's compassionate call lives in tension with our obstinate refusal 
to follow. And that, of course, is the whole story unfolding of the frustrating dynamic of the election of God's people all through the Old Testament. Uh, Because of that, we then find God's specific call coming to individuals, to prophetic individuals, uh, people like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Jonah, and so on. Uh, I rather like this picture. This is kind of a a classic picture because it seems to me summarise quite a lot that's true about ministry. (laughs) You get chewed up, swallowed, and then spat out on a beach. Um, Mind you, he's come out with a pretty good physique out of that, so... uh, (laughs) You must have been on your early morning runs, James. I, I, I rather quite like this. This is a modern version, which says more or less the same thing. So, I, I kind of always felt that's what I felt like on a Monday morning, on uh, you know after all the demands of, of, of a Sunday. But what does it feel to experience the call of God? Does it feel like a still small voice? Actually, for most of these people, it felt it felt like something cataclysmic, uh, uh, dramatic. Uh, it's, it's great, isn't it? We have that wonderful reading from Isaiah 6 at the beginning of ordination services. What must it have felt like to be in the Holy Place, to be in the temple in that experience? The sound, if you're in a small room and there's this sound, it reverberates around and, and the noise of the, the cry, holy, holy, is overcoming you. What does it sound feel like? The beating of the seraphim's wings in that space. I bet it hasn't been cleaned long. You know, James Dyson didn't get against the Holy of Holies. There's dust flying up everywhere. It's this extraordinary, overwhelming sense of the voice of God. And Isaiah falls down in terror. Actually, that may have been the experience for some of you in exploring vocation. But that seems to be one of the things that the, uh, the biblical um, writers say. Um, I was just reading this book by David Hoyle, The Pattern of Our Calling. And he's got a wonderful story at the beginning about on his ordination tree. He just felt absolutely terrified. I kind of want to say, that's quite right. Because for the prophets, that was their experience of hearing the call of God. Uh, Jeremiah, beginning of Jeremiah, he says, God calls him and says, I am going to make you like an iron wall. And people will come against you, but they will not destroy you. Wow, that's an inviting vision for pastoral ministry, isn't it? <laughs> Anyone here fancy being an iron wall that people are going to batter themselves against? No, thank you. And yet that is the reality of the experience of God's call. And of course, Jonah, when God calls him and he says, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not having this. I'm not interested because I know, I know what costly ministry is involved. I know what your grace is going to do and I don't like it. Thank you very much. And so Jonah goes down. He goes down away from God. He goes down to Tarship. He goes down in Tarship, down to the, uh, the harbour. In the harbour, he goes down to a ship. In the ship, he goes down to the hold. He tries to get as far away as he can. And then he's chucked out of the ship and he goes down into the depths. And even in the down in the depths, that isn't far enough because he goes down into the fish. And that's what happens as we run from the call of God. It drives us down. And of course, actually, as Jonah engages with God's call, that's when he begins that process of emerging upwards. God's call often doesn't come to us quietly. And here's another wonderful example of what the call of God does for people. Uh, This is uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti's picture of uh, the Annunciation. And I don't know, Mary doesn't look very happy about what... She's being called to, and I'm not surprised. And I find it really interesting to to see what we often do with God's vocation, God's calling of Mary in Luke chapter 1. I went went for an interview uh, to be a curate for someone and uh, sat through his sermon, and it happened to be the sermon on uh, the Annunciation, Luke chapter 1. And um, he was in a a, a nice, robust theological tradition, and what he learned from, what he told us from... uh, Uh, Mary's uh, from the Annunciation is that if you want to be called by God you must be virtuous you must be listening you must be willing you must be and there's a whole list of things that you ought to be I kind of felt as though I was experiencing a hardening of the arteries (laughs) but what's really fascinating is that the text says exactly the opposite the text says that the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. He doesn't even tell us his name, her name. Oh, by the way, the virgin's name was Mary. The narrative says, whatever virtues we may see subsequently in Mary, the narrative says that had nothing whatever to do with God's call. Mary was called because God decided to send an angel to a house in Nazareth. That was the reason. Um, and I wanted to say, well, 
he, I was being interviewed to be his curate, so I didn't actually give the feedback to the vicar at the time, but he didn't want me anyway, so that's fine. Um, uh, but th what's the lesson? The lesson is, if you want to be called by God, you're going to have to make an angel appear to you and announce this remarkable good news, okay? I don't know if you're good at making angels appear. I'm not. It's a bit of a struggle. And again, it points us to the sovereignty of God in his calling. And what's really fascinating is that what Gabriel says to her is, the Spirit of God will come on you and power will come on on high and you will give birth. And what's really fascinating about that is that Mary then testifies to God's grace. And what do we find in Acts chapter 1 and 2? We find exactly the same process. The Spirit of God comes from on high, power comes from on high, and Jesus says to the disciples, you will be my witnesses and the new movement we might call church comes to birth. So it's about the sovereignty of God, the Spirit of God, and the power of God coming on us to bring something to new birth by his will. A new act of creation, if you will. Um, and then we come on, to, of course, to uh, the formation of the apostolic community and Jesus' call of the disciples. I've already mentioned the way that this is disruptive, uh, and, and so they're called to a new loyalty. By the way, this is a mosaic from Ravenna in northern Italy. And one thing that's quite fascinating about this is that you can see the two characters in the boat. That's Peter there on the right of the two, and we know that because um, that's probably exactly what Peter looked like. I, I just, I don't say that, sorry, I wasn't there with a the camera, but it's just, um, it just so happens that if you see all the early iconography of Peter, has him, has him with light colored hair and with, a, and then with a bushy beard, curly hair like that. So it's actually, there's actually very good evidence that is what, what Peter looked like. Um, and I like the fact Jesus doesn't have a beard. I don't think Jesus did have a beard. And if you're interested in that, I've got a blog post about it. <laughs> Although I now have a beard. Um, so again, Jesus calls and, and they respond. And in fact, this is the primary way that scripture uses the language of call. This is the primary way that the scripture uses the language of vocation. It's the vocation, it's the call to know God. It's the, it's the call that Adam and Eve had in the garden where God calls out to them in the cool of the evening. It's the call that God calls Abraham with to know him and to be in relationship with him. It's the call of Jesus to know them. That's the primary thing. And what's interesting here is that we think that um, Jesus called them and said, you have fished for fish, and now you're going to be fishers of men, so that we can have a jolly children's chorus, which I don't know if we still sing anymore. I will make you fishers of men. Anyone sing that nowadays? Yes? Okay, great. He didn't, actually. This is, this is language of eschatological judgment. Because God's going to come and bring his kingdom at the ends of the ages, and he's going to fish men out from the thing, and he's going to judge the world. But that doesn't make such a good children's chorus. Have you ever tried that? I will make you fishers of men, and those who don't come will burn in hell forever. It just doesn't really... <laughs> it doesn't work in the same way, but that is really what's going on here. And what's really interesting is the way that Jesus calls them to something which is new, but also something which has continuity. And Mike Higdon has written about this in a Grove booklet, excellent Grove booklet, actually on a theology of higher education, but he has in the middle of it um, a really interesting reflection on what Jesus is doing here. Jesus sees what these two people currently are and he calls them to a strange fulfillment of what they are. They become in that moment disciples, they become learners, they are captivated by the possibility of transformation. In other words, the vocation of God isn't simply about saying, well, You've got this inner desire to do X, so I'm going to enable you to do that. He actually says, you've got an inner desire to do X, which is catch fish. Actually, I'm going to give you a desire, and I'm going to call you to do Y. Now, X and Y might have some relation to one another. They might not. But actually, I'm going to call you to something new and something transformative. Then we see, I need to keep moving on. Uh, then we see um, the continuing uh, movement of uh, God's calling, from the calling of the apostolic community in Jesus' ministry uh, to the calling of uh, some of those to uh, mission. And this is Acts chapter 13. Now, you may not recognize these people, but these are the five leaders of the church in Antioch in Acts chapter 13. Um, actually, it's not quite. I did look online for a picture of those five, but nobody's actually done one. So as it happens, this is a 1960s or 70s pioneering band, a multiracial rock band called The Equals. But they'll nearly do. The reason is, there are five of them, and in Acts 13 we read, now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, uh, a Jew, Simeon, who was called Niger, um, which is a word we hope Donald Trump's never going to use, 
because uh, he's a black African. Sorry, there was a little political joke snugged in there, but okay, don't. Um, Lucius of Cyrene, who looks very much like a, a Roman, a wealthy Roman, Manaean, a member of the court of Herod the ruler, and Saul, a former Pharisee. So essentially, out of these five, you could not find probably a more culturally or racially diverse group. And they are worshipping the Lord and fasting, and the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And for me, this is really crucial as a, a text for me, as I was thinking about uh, whether God was calling me to ordination that I sensed in this verse, God was saying to me, he was setting me apart. And again, just some things to observe about the way God's call comes and the way God's call functions. So it's communal. It's communal in a diverse community which reflects the vision, the, the mission of God to transform the world. It's a community, a diverse community, which is involved in fasting and in praying. And, and a community that's listening to what the Spirit is saying. And what's really fascinating is that I think when, if most of us heard the Spirit say, right, so-and-so is going to get up and do that job, we'd say, right, let's organize it. What do they do? They then continue to fast and to pray. So the call of God is actually the beginning of a process of discernment and not the end. After fasting and praying, then they laid hands on them, and then they sent them off. Two, um, three, two three last points. Two points in Paul, uh, and one point to conclude in this, this tour around. Um, that's a picture to represent what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. Of course, one of the key texts that people refer to in relation to vocation, uh, one that I think Luther made quite a lot of, and Paul talks about, 1 Corinthians 7 is a remarkable chapter. Uh, it's remarkable in lots of different ways. It's remarkable because it tells people who are married they ought to be having sex and not praying, which I think is quite interesting that Paul says that. It's remarkable because actually the reference to male and female is entirely symmetrical, so that in 1 Corinthians 7, 4, women, wives should exercise authority over their husbands' bodies in the same way that husbands exercise authority over their wives' bodies, which I think is extraordinary given the first century culture. But what's the, the thrust of the chapter, the, 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 the main point Paul is making is to say, look, it, this kingdom life has come and this eschatological reality and we're highly expectant for Jesus to return again and you know, we're in this amazing moment, yet that is not a reason to leave the particular situation in life that you're at. You should stay in the position in which God called you. Now, I think there's a danger in us thinking that what Paul is saying is that God called you to be a doctor or a nurse or an accountant or a builder or whatever. I don't think he's saying that. What he's saying is saying you don't need to change your role that you were in when God called you to faith. When God called you to follow Jesus, he called you to follow Jesus in the place you are now. So that on the one hand, the vocation of God does have a disruptive effect on our patterns of relationship and our situation. And for some, like the uh, first disciples, it meant leaving where they were at. And for Paul, it meant changing course. But actually, God wants to affect the transformation of his calling in the situation that we are all in. If you're a bus driver, when you come to faith, now work out your calling to follow Jesus as a bus driver. If you're an accountant when you came to faith, what does it mean to be a Christian accountant? Uh, we suffer very often, I think we suffer where I am in our church, of thinking that mission is about doing something extra. So we're a city centre church, so we're only doing mission if after we've done our day job, we then go out and help the homeless. Or after we've done our day, day job, we then go out and provide something for the nightclubbers who stagger out uh, after binge drinking and they need someone to drag them out of the gutter and whatever. We think that's the only part, part where, place of mission. It isn't. It is an important part of mission. But we've also got the senior surgeon from Queen's Medical Centre. And I can't remember a single sermon, I'm probably, I don't know if I've preached one, on what does it mean to be a Christian surgeon? What does it mean to be a Christian solicitor, a lawyer? What does it mean to work out our vocation in the place that God called us to faith? Uh, just a quick observation in moving on to 1 Corinthians 12 about the variety of gifts that the Spirit gives. Again, this isn't a chapter so much highlighting the question of vocation, uh, but it does talk about the spirit sovereignty. Uh, and there's two dynamics in this chapter. One dynamic is the dynamic of variegation, of individuation, if you like. The spirit gives to each a different gift, to one this gift, to another this gift, to another this gift. But actually, as you read through the passage, there's this constant moving backwards and forwards between individuation on the one hand and community on the other. So to one the spirit gives this gift, 
for the common good. To another this gift, for the common good. To a third this gift, for the common good. And actually the individuation of vocation, the individual of gifting and calling, uh, only finds its fulfilment in the identity of community, of the new community that the Spirit has formed. And of course, again, the theme running through that is the sovereignty of the Spirit of God. I, I, was, I was in different parts of the church. Uh, it's assumed you have different gifts and it sort of changes from one time to another. Um, I, I was quickly encountered the charismatic movement and, uh, when I was a teenager uh, on cipher camps in the summer. And so the gift you had to have was speaking in tongues. You had to have. And so I went on a course how to speak in tongues. <laughs> I was taught, I tried it, I practiced. And after a while, I really decided that the God, the Spirit of God, in his sovereignty, was not giving me this gift. So I stopped. Um, in certain national conferences, the, the particular gift is a word of knowledge, if you go to those conferences. If you're not someone who has words of knowledge, you're not really there, you know? But the Spirit of God gives different gifts to each in the Spirit's sovereignty for the common good. And lastly, uh, and of course, um, we couldn't go through without mentioning... This one, uh, the God's eschatological call. Because, of course, all through the New Testament, uh, we know that everything about faith, everything about the kingdom of God, the gift of the Spirit, is actually God's eschatological future brought forward into the present. As we step into following Jesus, as we step into resurrection life, as we receive the gift of the Spirit, every time we do that, we are stepping into the future of the world. That's why in Romans 8, Paul talks about the fact that, you know, the, 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 the whole world is groaning and looks to the children of God to see that future realized. And, and so therefore, in Revelation, uh, the, the promises to those who conquer, those who, who live out the victory, uh, the, the th- whole theme of Revelation is that Jesus has won the victory by his death on the cross, his resurrection, and his ascension. That's what the whole of Revelation 12 is about. And then around that... We don't yet see that victory fully realized. One day we will, that's Revelation 19 to 22. Therefore, in the present, our task is to hear God's voice, to hear his calling to, quote unquote, come out of Babylon. We live in an age where there are other empires, other kingdoms. We live in a world that does not accept that Jesus is Lord. And therefore, we have to live our vocation in coming out from Babylon. This is from Luther's Bible, by the way, so just if you can forget the papal tiara on the top of the Whore of Babylon, that's just his own particular interpretation. But, but, but in every age, in every age, there is a kingdom, an empire, which, which, which demands our loyalty, which draws us in, which sucks us in, which compromises our vocation to stay as faithful witnesses to Jesus. And the whole shape of Revelation from the beginning to the end is about saying, stay true to your calling, Uh, live in the victory that Jesus has already won, and one day that victory will be fully realized. So those are just a few soundings from uh, across the breadth of Scripture. And I just wanted two things to finish with. So the first is to um, share some of my experience of of vocation. And as it happened, I've got just seven, seven particularly key moments, I think, to... Uh, to, to reflect on. And, and the first is, is my own call to faith through Paul Owens tearing Coke cans and stuff. I was brought up in a church background. Um, my mother was a, a Roman Catholic from, from Dublin, from Ireland, and she came over to the UK in 1947, just after that thing, that little emergency. Do you know that thing that happened from 1939 to 1945, which the Irish call an emergency, okay? <laughs> and she came over and she realized that because she called it an emergency, whereas we called it a cataclysmic global warfare, then Irish people weren't very welcome. So she shed her Irish accent. She met my father and they got married. So I was, I was brought along to, to church. So I was church going and I dressed in a red cassock and did stuff on the altar and all that kind of thing. But actually, uh, a pa- sense of personal faith was never part of that. And, it, it, and I had to meet a different group of people for that to become real to me. And I never really understood that as vocation until looking back afterwards. It was only with the benefit of hindsight I had a sense in which I wasn't particularly looking for God. I was looking for lots of things. I had all sorts of questions. But I had a sense that God was looking for me. And he he wanted me to know him. So he arranged it through a very odd set of circumstances. I bumped into Paul Owen and this other group of people. And through that came to discover 
uh, God's love for myself and the way that it, it changed and transformed the whole of my life, not just what I did on Sunday evenings at 6.30. So that was a key moment of vocation, uh, of calling for me. The second one was, happened when I was um, 17, when I was listening to some teaching by a, a, a well-known Baptist minister, and I had a very strong sense God was calling me to inner urban life, ministry, whatever. I hadn't, wasn't give ordination then. But it was someone who was talking about the needs of the inner cities. And that actually was quite an important shaper for me. It shaped a number of decisions I made. Um, it mean, meant I ended up working in industrial business because, and living in, in a multi-ethnic area in Slough, or as other people just called it, North Windsor. <laughs> the house is worth more when you call it North Windsor. If you ever go to Slough by train, it's fantastic. The train pulls in and the person announcing it goes, Slough, this is Slough. Think, yeah, I can see what's coming here. Um, so, so that was an interesting experience. But it, it, it shaped my, when I actually went to ordination training, it shaped my placement. So I chose placements in uh, inner city Bradford uh, and so on. And I didn't actually end up in um, inner city ministry, not really, for, for a number of complex reasons. But that was a, 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 another way in which I heard um, a call. Um, the third one then was a call to ordination. And as I've already mentioned, that actually for me it was much more a, a sense of an exploration of an exterior sense of call. As an as a undergraduate university, exploring, now, what, how was God using me? What were my giftings? What was I doing? I was actually being drawn into a teaching ministry. And I looked around, and I'm sorry, some, some of you in certain aspects of Church of England tradition might find this slightly horrifying especially as I taught in the theological college. But I, I looked around and said, well, who, who has the teaching ministry in the church? And the answer is, it's people with a dog collar on. So I thought, well, I'd better go and get one of those. And that's how I began the exploration. I went to the vicar of the church at Christ Church, Orpington, and I knocked on the door uh, of the vicar and, and I said, I've just had this thought. He says, oh, good. I was wondering when you were going to come and talk to me. So, again, external, hearing the voice of God from outside, through other people, in a communal context, and through his people. And actually, it seems to me that the Church of England has got it right, that widening circle of discernment through the people of God, uh, locally, through friendships, through local church, through the diocese, through the national church structure. I think it's actually uh, a very robust and sound process. Um, PhD. I, I, I did a PhD because God called me to. Out of a, a holiday with some friends, when I was thinking about the, the possibilities for the future, and praying together, and a very strong sense of God saying, yes, this is the right, the right thing to do. Uh, and that, again, people find that very odd. Um, marrying my wife, Maggie. Um, uh, now, how much personal disclosure, appropriate personal disclosure. <laughs> yeah. we, we met um, at Gatwick South Terminal, which is very romantic, um, on a skiing holiday, which we organized by phone, but hadn't really met before. But after three days, I thought, this is the sort of person I'd like to marry. Now, what was interesting about that was that that I would now locate that within God's vocation on humanity to either the path of singleness, celibacy uh, of, of Jesus and Paul, or a path of marriage. Uh, um, and therefore, God's call was in the boundaries uh, of what God has called humanity to uh, as a whole. Uh, Call to Nottingham to teach at St. John's Theological College in 2004. I hadn't expected that at all. Christina Baxter was principal at the time. We, I was on General Synod, and she said, I wonder if you'd come and teach. And I said, no, I'm not going to, sorry. And then she asked me again. I said, no, I'm, I, no, I know. I, I didn't have a pleasant experience at the end of my time at St. John's, and I know the college is in trouble. At the, at the time, they had 50-something students, and no, thank you. And she asked me again, no. And I said, well, I said, well, I said well, I'll do. I'll come and talk to you, and if God calls us, then we'll come, but not otherwise. And I went for an interview, and in fact, I was the only candidate for the job. But I've been the only candidate for a job in the past and didn't get it, so that didn't guarantee anything. <laughs> that was an achievement, I tell you. Um, but as we went, and in conversation, and even though my wife was in a, a partner in a GP practice, and it was going to be majorly disruptive, we together just had a very strong sense this was God, what God was calling us to. Uh, and then leaving St. John's in 2013 arose out of another very specific call of God. In the summer of 2011, I was praying, and God gave me a word. Do you know when people say, oh, I've got a word for you, or oh, I've had a word from God? Usually they don't mean a word. Usually they mean a paragraph, or a sentence, or a book, or something like that. I had a word. And the word was, write. That was it. Write. Okay. So I thought I'd better start writing. So I started a blog, and and in, in the end, because I wanted to write, I wanted to shed the other responsibilities in college, and that didn't go down very well. So in the end, we parted company. But that is what God has now called me to do.
So those are my experiences. And I think, for me, they connect with some of those things I've talked about in those, in those 10 themes. But I need to finish now so we can have time for questions. And I just want to make some, a couple of observations uh, about how that then revisits um, our first five. Oh, sorry. Uh, I just say so all those things for me wrapped together in my rule of life. And I felt very strongly when I first had a rule of life about 20 years ago that I needed to um, just, just set out in writing what I felt God was calling me to in terms of my shape of living. And that involved not just spiritual, what we call spiritual disciplines, also involved practical things like exercise. Uh, and like spending time, particularly in the theological college, it's really key to make sure you spend time in a non-churchy environment. So part of my rule of life is always to hang around in a non-churchy place. Uh, that's one of the reasons I ran a squash league for a while, uh, just so that I was spending time with people who, with no contact with church at all. And at the end of my rule of life, I put this. This is the pattern of life I believe God is calling me to. If I achieve it, it's with his grace. If I fail, it is with forgive it's with his forgiveness. Because God's call onto us is always a call to transformation and a call to new life, but it's a call of grace. So where does that leave us? A couple of things. These are quite big ideas, um, but um, I'll leave these with you and we can explore them further in questions. What does it do when we look at the economy of God? The first and the fundamental thing it does is it shifts the focus from the called to the caller. Vocation is a verb, not a noun. You only have a vocation if someone has called you. And in Scripture, the thing that's important is the person doing the calling. Does anyone recognize who this is? No, good, you shouldn't. This is Andrea Yeager. I think in the 70s, she was the world number two tennis champion. And then God called her to be a nun. And she was, uh, you know, they had back of the church times, they often have an interview with people and, you know, blah, blah, blah. This, uh, one of the questions they always have, and she was interviewed oh, quite a few years ago, and one of the questions is, what do you want to be remembered for? And she said, why do I need anyone to remember me? What mattered is the caller, not the one called. Secondly, um, Locating vocation in widening circles. God has a, a mission for the world, for the world to be transformed, for the, uh, for the uh, world to be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. And in order to do that, he's called a people to himself. And within the people he's called to himself, he calls certain people to various ministries. So he calls apostles and evangelists and teachers and uh, uh, pastors and so on but the reason that he calls pastors and teachers and evangelists is to equip the people of God so that they can facilitate they can enable they can be engaged with God's transformation of the world and there are people in the world who don't yet know that transformation themselves but that doesn't mean the gospel has nothing to say to them God has a vision for the world and therefore we have something to say for people who live in the world God has concerns for the health service. God has concerns for the realm of economics, for government, for, teach, for education, even apart from the coming of the kingdom. So we have something to say both for the kingdom and for the common good. But for those in our congregations, then we want to facilitate their vocation both as part of the people of God, but also as agents of transformation of the world in which they live. So we need to recognize the different vocations of different people in those widening circles. Thirdly, we need to relate uh, vocations together, making different vocations interdependent. Absolutely fascinating report I recommend anyone read from the Faith and Order Commission on leadership in the church. I don't know if anyone's seen it. I suspect not. It's free. It's PDF. It's really interesting to look at. And they say something really profound about vocation to ministry. They say this. At a very simple level, we can represent a triangular dynamic of the relationships between those in ministry, in, in ordained ministry, and the church of God, the people of God. In this diagram, the two sides of the triangle represent a double calling. God calls his people, and God calls individuals to lead his people. The base of the triangle represents the complex two-way relationship between people and leaders, a relationship created by God's double call. Here's the triangle. <clears throat> 
God calls his people, but also God calls leaders into ministry of all different sorts. And I love that phrase, the line connecting the leaders and people represent the complex relationship that arises. Anyone here know about a complex relationship between <laughs> leaders and people? But it arises out of that double vocation. Uh, vocation reflecting God's sovereign decision. We do not make ourselves, and this is really good news. I preached a few weeks ago on the doctrine of, we're going through the creed on I believe in God the Father who made the heavens and the earth. And one of the things I said is, particularly to our evening congregation of young people, you do not create yourself. You've been created by God. And some of the young people came up to me and said, that is such good news because the world tells me I need to create myself. And that is immensely stressful. God calls us into being who we are. And lastly, well, let's, see, let's recognize the tension between calling and choice. In recognizing God's call on our lives, we need to dethrone the tyrant called choice. Choice we find everywhere. We choose what to buy. We choose who to be. I, when I was a governor at school, end of term talk. Well done, everybody. You now can choose to be whatever you can. And I really want to say to the deputy head who said that, I'm sorry, that is a lie, and that is an oppressive lie. And our young people are living under the terrible oppression of burden of choice. They, they choose 40,000 things when they go into Tesco's. They choose who they want to be. They, they, they choose which phone they have. They can, apparently, they can do anything. That is a terrible burden to give people. And actually, God's sovereign vocation on us is wonderfully liberating because God's choice for us is always infinitely better than our choice for ourselves. That's all I have to say about that.